Um, while the report that you talked about talked in general terms and talked about a lot of regional variations, I'm going to argue that there's a, the regional variations are becoming more and more minimized because of the retail sector and some other movements going on across the globe. But let's start first before I even talk about food. I can't see my slides now. And Roxana, can you turn off mute your item? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what happened uh, with my slides being lost can by that. Can you see them um, now? <laughs> no, but I'll look at my guys. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're, we're, we're working on this. But at any rate, while we've got someone here to get these slides from not dropping, uh, the, the reality is that we've had probably the major drivers in creating the global shift in obesity around the low and middle income countries are not diet. They're the enormous decreases in the technology in work, home production, transit, and even in toward inactive leisure. The, and, and we pretty much documented those with countries where we followed longitudinally for 25 to 30 years the population and measured all them. However, you're not going to go back and get people to go from the little tiny power tractors to hand plows and to sowing uh, fertilizer by hand and so forth. So, so that what, that's where we come to the food supply. And the food supply has been the driver in many low-income countries really in the last decade. Whereas I would say much of the origins of the problem come with the shift in technology in work and home production and transit. Uh, just as Ross, Roxanne in, uh, noted some of them. Uh, but when you come to commonalities across the way the global diets are shifting, and I could go country by country, even in sub-Saharan Africa, and show you this where we have individual diet data and other things. Uh, we have these kind of three major increases going on that are everywhere. The UK, the US, and Mexico have about the same amount of snacking in terms of calories per day as does Brazil. Somewhere about 20 to 25% of our calories come from that. That's an invented behavior that's happened over the last half century, but really in the Mexico's and Brazil's and China, China didn't even snack in, in 1990 or 2000. And welcome Tim Lang. Uh, I hope you biked in in nasty wet weather. Just like the weather we have here, we have London weather. Uh, so uh, essentially the, uh, Aside from the Tim Langs who might bike, uh, public transit has been one of the drivers. Now let's come to these diet shifts again. Uh, all of these changes I mentioned in terms of global increases are pretty uniform in the top part. When we go to global decreases, unfortunately, across much of the world, legumes, pulses, beans, whatever we call it, that was a major part of the staple in many cultures, are being lost. Vegetables are being lost. Fruits are varying from country to country in how much are consumed. But, and we'll come back in South Korea and talk about where South Korea is and where they're going now, uh, which will surprise you a little. But uh, come to the low and middle income world, where they're unique is between the 50s and the 80s, in Europe and the US, we increased significantly our consumption of edible vegetable oils. That has happened in the last 20 years in a much higher basis in Asia, Africa, in particular in the Middle East, and to a lesser extent in, in, in Latin America. And so you will have countries in Asia like China where on a per capita basis where we measure at the beginning and end of every day how much oil 20, 30,000 people eat, we'll have three to 400 calories of vegetable oil consumed in a day. And we'll have more in Malaysia, Indonesia, and some other countries in Asia. And we'll have equal amounts in a lot of parts of Africa and elsewhere. So vegetable oil and its use is a unique feature in the low-income world and the, the amount of it that's gone on. 
that's gone on. It was the cheapest way to improve the quality of the diet. There's lots of organoelectric qualities to it. And that's before it ever reached the modern food supply in terms of processed food. This was food added just as we consume. So now let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is a very, this is taking data like the Imperial College did around 800,000 women of childbearing age, looking at where they were in the 90s in terms of overweight and underweight, uh, and looking at the annual change in rural areas in the last 15 years or so uh, in underweight for women of childbearing age and <laughs> overweight plus obesity. And as you can see, uh, pretty much across rural areas as well as urban areas, you see the same kinds of changes. Now, when I look at preschoolers, which is the only other bit data we have, and it's, it's a very risky item for looking at undernutrition, the picture is a little different and there's still more undernutrition, but it's the trends are the same. And the trends are accelerating in rural areas across Africa and Asia, much more than urban areas, so that the speed of change in most of rural Asia in the last decade is far outweighing that of urban Asia and that's part of where the shift of the burden is going toward the poor. Uh, this is just taking you through a whole bunch of countries. And if you looked, you'd see a whole lot of sub-Saharan African countries in there where overweight's going up. It may be tiny yet. In urban areas, it may be 10, 15, 20% overweight. But in rural areas, it may be a lot more. But it's just showing you that there are only a few countries where underweight is going up in women of childbearing age. Uh, and if I took out India, which has the last data for India, unfortunately, is 2002, and I had the new data for India, it would be half of that because of the massive public works programs and other things that have gone on in the last five or six years and go on every time before a new election. But uh, now, let's move to the future. So first, you brought up in your report and you asked me to speak a little about South Korea. And prior to the World Trade Organization, we had done several papers with South Korea that showed enormous vegetable intake, an education system that every woman that got married was given two weeks of training and traditional diet, which focused on lots of vegetable dishes, and they had one of the highest vegetable intakes in the world. Uh, not so different than the high vegetable and fruit intake in Greece and South and Spain, which doesn't lead to necessarily reduced obesity compared to other countries. But the difference was these were low-fat ways of cooking they were taught, and it really was quite effective. Then let's start with the World Trade Organization opening up the country. And before the mix, that happened in South Korea, they had signs all over, eat traditional food. They were keeping out traditional modern processors. They were, to some extent, keeping out traditional retailing, although they had their own retail giants that were starting to move into Asia in a very big way. And that's changed. And the diets are changing quite remarkably. In three or four papers we've put out since then, the kinds of trends that, trends that we see elsewhere, sugary beverages, and it's a cohort effect. So kids under 30, 40, and under are shifting quite remarkably in South Korea. So what was there in South Korea in the 80s and 90s will in 20 years be gone. And they don't have the level of overweight for their income that one would expect, but it's gone. I'm not going to spend much time, whoops, let's see, how do I shift this? I, there we go. I was going to talk about Mexico before I knew about Roxanne. I've been involved in Mexico, and we're involved now with the National Institute of Public Health in evaluating the changes. We have actually already seen greater in the, in the 700 stores we're monitoring and the rural areas and in the stores we're looking and in, in the data from, from the big cities, we are actually seeing bigger price increases in some cases than the one peso increase in taxes on sugary beverages, which doesn't tax chocolate milk, doesn't tax, tax sugary yogurt, doesn't tax 100% juices. It only taxes all the added sugar beverages otherwise. So it may very well be that what's going to happen is we're going to see a substitution, which our data shows toward chocolate milk 
and towards some of the juices and other things, and I don't know what the net effect will be. But unlike Roxanne's knowledge, our elasticities from the last 2012 data show a quite high price elasticity among the poor and just a slightly lower price elasticity among the rich, 1.3 for the poor, 0.9 for the rich, and some substitutions toward healthier beverages like milk among some age groups, and toward other foods. Now, we have never modeled or even thought of a junk food tax. That 10% junk food tax was added, and it's quite all-inclusive. So we don't know what the two taxes will do. We're getting purchase data from, uh, scan data from uh, tens of thousands of consumers from 2012, 13, 14, 15. We'll have a sense what this does, but we it'll take some time. And this is really the first rigorous evaluation of taxes that we'll have in any country. Uh, so we don't know what it will do. Now, what I wanted to add and talk about in the future is, unlike your report, I actually am seeing in most low and middle income countries in Africa, Middle East, and Asia, an accelerated increase in adolescent and young adult overweight and a similar but slower increase in older adult overweight. So that I see, and secondly, a bigger problem. We saw it in Mexico already in some paper we have coming out. We're seeing it in China. We're seeing it elsewhere. Is a waist circumference increase that's quite significant and and bad because of the cardiometabolic and cancer kind of complexities that come with that fat around the waist and in the, around the liver and the heart. So the problems are even a little worse than Roxana noted just because partly the genetic proclivity and that leads to the visceral fat. And that's not just happening in Mexico and all the Andean countries up and down the region, but it's also happening in East Asia and some other regions. So we have, uh, a double whammy of both weight going up, but also a lot of it happening in the waist area, which is the most metabolically dangerous component. The second thing is we are now starting to see, Mexico is just one example. If I, I could go through the Americas and I could go through some other countries I'm working on now, we are going to see the low and middle income countries as the only countries other than some little taxes in France and the short-lived fat tax and saturated fat tax in Denmark. We are going to see in the next five or six years a number of other examples of regulatory things going on in, in a number of countries. Ecuador has already done some things on marketing and uh, media. Uh, there are some countries in Asia that are planning some taxes. There's a lot of front of the label fat profiling going on, getting rid of some claims in some countries. Mexico tried some of that. If we had the old regime, we'd have had a lot more. We don't have a lot because we have a very conservative government in power. Uh, but so that so we are starting to begin to see th changes. We need to evaluate them. We have no evidence-based data on these large-scale regulatory changes and will they matter? And until that happens, we are in a very difficult spot of promoting with the development agencies, with the countries, uh, these kinds of changes. So it's, that's a call for rigorous evaluation, Syria, for sure. Uh, the third point that I wanted to talk about, because this is what's happening in the Middle East, all of Asia, all of urban Africa has already hit Latin America, is an enormous growth of the retail sector, both convenience stores, supermarkets, and mega markets. It started in the early 90s, late 80s in Mexico. It also started at that point in Taiwan, South Korea, and a few other places in Asia. Actually, even some of the Indian government stores were starting a retail sector that was private. And it's really accelerating now this decade in Asia, like 50% of your growth in China, 20, 30, 40% growth in some other Asian countries. There's a lot of benefits in the retail sector. They give, deal with the cold chain. They deal with sanitation. They deal with convenience and prices, but you know what they also do. They're part of creating this obesogenic environment that we're really quite concerned with, the vending, 
the, 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 the proliferation of marketing. And the marketing that's come with it is enormous in Asia and Africa. There's not an African or Asian country you won't go to where you won't see modern marketing for all the same products. So it's, it's an issue we hardly understand. We understand it somewhat in the U.S. and Europe, but we don't understand what it means yet in a lot of these countries. Then we move to agriculture. And what I, if you had seen a recent report by IFPRI done for Bangladesh, India, and China, which followed the whole chain up the, up the line, and you'd seen some similar smaller studies done in a few other regions in Africa and elsewhere, you would see that agriculture is being changed. The nature of agriculture is being driven by retailers, agribusinesses, and, and large food companies much more than we can imagine in the low and middle income countries. And this is going to change the nature in ways that we hardly understand today of the food supply and how it's directed and where it goes. Uh, and lastly, if I take you to a lot of cities in China, I take you to the squatter areas I went, I lived in and I go back to them. I take you to anywhere in Asia, Latin America, urban areas, African urban areas, the obesogenic environment that we talk about in the US and the UK and then a few other places is re and Australia for sure is hitting these countries very much so. Vending machines are becoming available everywhere. Advertisement, billboard, billboards are everywhere. Part of the reason in Mexico we won with the taxes is because we had money from a, a Bloomberg philanthropies that offset the billboards of the industry and had press conferences and used the media with a lot of resources behind it to fight the uh, the others, the industry pushing against these regulations there. So we have to realize the obesogenic environment we talk about in Europe and US is there in the rest of these countries and it's growing. And that indeed is really our challenge, is using these large scale regulations and starting to build the policy database to deal with it. So my main points are that I think the report underplays some of the shifting going on, doesn't deal enough with the retail sector and the change in the nature of agriculture that's following with it. And uh, I think that these things and these shifts uh, plus the enormous decline that's already occurred in Asia and is incurring in Africa in fiscal activity are, are leading us to uh, a time bomb. You know the environmental side that comes with this, you know the water side that's occurring, and now you see this obesity and diet shift going on, and the acceleration of it is far greater than the IFPRI report that you, rep that you give uh, credence to in terms of the animal food shift. So I think that we have to realize the confluence between all these forces, and we have to start to focus on the food supply and regulations to deal with it uh, as part of considering how we're going to move to deal with both health as well as environment and other issues. And I'll stop there. And I'll, well, I'll wait for any questions before I mute myself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Barry, let, let, let me just ask one question, which I, I guess is the obvious one. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's an incredibly distressing and worrying story that you tell. And as you say, you know, the, this, um, this, this does look like a dietary time bomb. But I, I guess the big, the, you know, the, the, the big question is how do we defuse it? And what, what I wonder, you know, if you, as, on the basis of your research, as you look around the world, what, what would you hold up? as positive examples of, of, you know, of countries that have tried to put in place the type of regulatory measures that hold out the promise of making a difference? We haven't had these regulatory measures until the last three to four years. Thailand has started a huge education push, and now we're going to put with it a bunch of regulations uh, that push toward smaller waste down to the village level and the kind of education that Roxanne talked about that's very effective in the way that Thailand has learned to be effective. Uh, they dealt with undernutrition, they dealt with family planning, they dealt with AIDS very quickly in the same way. They're very good with large-scale public health efforts. Uh, we don't know what that will do. 
We don't know because we're only starting the regulatory side that goes with it to see what we can do. We really don't have a good example in a low and middle income country that is holding against this and stopping the ship. Mexico, under the previous president, started a whole lot of things. Roxanne has very talked about that that is probably half of which is being gutted by the conservative president right now, some of which is happening like these taxes. But a lot of the other changes they really wanted are not occurring. And uh, there are a few countries like Ecuador and others that are really taking things on. But the Brazil's and Chile efforts have been stymied by legal and food industry kinds of changes, even when they were passed into law. They've used legal or, or under the table kinds of political manipulations to slow them down. So we are in a big fight in, in Latin America to try to get the policies that people are trying to put in place to improve public health. In Asia, we only have minimal efforts today. Uh, the, the South Korean effort is an old effort. So, the, que the point is, we're in an era where, of decade where I think a lot of these changes, countries are desperate. Thailand is desperate. Mexico's desperate. Ecuador's desperate. Chile, Brazil, others can handle the health costs that come with this and the morbidity and so forth. So I think it's going to depend on what large-scale things happen and how what we see is effective, but we don't really have anything yet that I can say or Roxanne could say, we know we can make this happen and we can improve diets in a meaningful way yet. Okay, thank so you, Barry. Is, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Barry. Um, so, um, Tim, I've already done a very, one very flattering introduction, but that was before I knew you were going to be late. Um, I, I, actually, I, I think a lot of you will know Tim. He's professor, as, as I said before, of uh, food policy um, at City University. Um, but I, I think he's also much more than that, actually. I mean, I think Tim has, um, in an extraordinary way, combined being a campaigner who's really made a difference on public policy and nutritional issues with being an outstanding academic researcher. And I, and I think it's that combination that has, um, you know, has made Tim such a powerful voice in, in this debate. So it, it's a huge privilege. He's also an old friend of mine, I should say. So always flatter. You're all of that. Always flatter your old friends. <laughs> so um, Tim, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, I, I think you know a lot of the background to the discussion, but you have uh, 10 minutes before we, we throw open to, to debate. So over to you. 